studied both uh, applied science, uh, uh, psychology before the working on the clinical audio, audio disc in the post radio. Later, he undertook study in Since uh, 1986, he had worked at the clinical herbalist in Sweden. He completed his PhD at the University of West, uh, Westminster, London, UK, in 12, 2012. His thesis was titled uh, The Impact of Bitter Test and, and <coughs> Adiabatic System. Very interesting. That's uh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, Good morning, and thank you to the organizers for asking me to present my research. And for those of you who haven't finished your PhD, don't give up because I didn't get mine until I was 57 years old. Shouldn't be an inspiration, but it's a long process. So, do I have a? Okay, good. So, bitter tastings are important in traditional medicine. Uh, they're found in all cultures. We've got andrographis, uh, and this is found both in the World Health Organization and the newly produced uh, European Medical Agency monographs. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with these, both of these are available online without cost. Uh, the EMA is particularly good because it's only a couple of years old, most of the monographs there. Uh, we also have another one, Artemisia absinthum, in English known as wormwood. Centarium, uh, European, Coptus, Chinese, uh, different types of gentian. This is the European one, and this is more Eastern one. Uh, Devil's claw from Africa, hops, which we heard a bit about the other day, and then from Jamaica, Quassia. With the Excelsior here, meaning more bitter than you can describe. Well, there's two major theories how bitters could work. One is the cephalic vagal reflex. The idea is that the stimulation of oral bitter receptors act to increase vagal stimulation to the digestive organs. The other one is the local reflex. The stimulation of both or either oral and gut bitter receptors acts locally to increase digestive secretions. <coughs> uh, this cephalic vagal reflex actually is much older and published much older than we might think. Uh, there's a book called Materia Medica that was originally written by Hale White in 1892. This book continued in publication the early 1960s. So you can actually trace the way pharmacologists looked at bitters. Uh, and this book in 1892 where he outlined this idea that it was stimulation from the mouth because you didn't know about the vagal nerve in that time. It predated both Cannon's work on the autonomic nerve system and it also predated Pavlov's work. Uh, this very popular with herbalists. Many pharmacologists also subscribe to it. And in the European Medical, Ag Medical Agency monographs, uh, the gentian monograph that was written, it is fact that the bitter constituents stimulate the gustatory nerves in the mouth and give rise to an increase in the secretion of gastric, bile, or gastric fluid and bile. Well, for me, as, some, as soon as somebody said it's fact, it means that it's not fact. If it was a fact, you wouldn't have to say it was a fact. So basically, there is no clinical evidence for this. 
And there's a problem is, if people take something that's bitter, and they have a normal digestion, why doesn't it lead to overproduction of digestive enzymes? Now, psychologists also love to say, or phallic reflexes, you see something and you get hungry. Well, what about people who are working in the food industry? Are they constantly eating? No. So, so these psychologists, well, it looks good in the lab, but in the real world it doesn't really add up. Then we have local reflex. This is popular with pharmacologists. Basically, if you put it in your mouth, the body will digest it. Very convenient because then you can go on and talk about flavonoids and alkaloids and everything and kind of ignore anything else. Uh, so very importantly, this was supported by the discovery of bitter receptors in the gastrointestinal tract. So therefore, you could have you could take a bitter in a capsule form and expect it to actually have an effect on digestion. It also meant that if you drank bitters, you could taste them in the mouth and also effectively be aware of them or taste them in the gut and it would have a response. Uh, and of course it's well known that in the oral cavity we're sensitive to bitters and sour tastes and they increase saliva. But let's have a look at this. Uh, our own work indicated that when uh, healthy people ingested 133 milligrams of caffeine, it did actually increase diastolic pressure. Now this is not in the blood. We're not talking about plasma caffeine, we're talking about gastric caffeine. So when the capsule opened, 10 to 15 minutes after ingestion, diastolic pressure went up. So that's an indication for local response. Good, that really supports the local reflex theory. But when people drink the same amount of caffeine in coffee, or caffeine is added to decaffeinated coffee, the effect does not occur, which indicates that these receptors may be very susceptible to uh, cofactors happening. So, other alkaloids or substances in coffee are actually blocking the effect of caffeine. And then we go further to the problem, if you're actually eating a food which contains something bitter, how much of these bitter receptors in the stomach are going to be exposed in a whole meal time? So does the local reflex occur only in the laboratory using isolated substances, or does it really have an impact in the food? And digesting food is very demanding for the body. It's just as demanding as standing up. You have to have a cardiovascular response. And this is because the gut opens up and the blood is diverted from the aorta into the digestive system, which is called dysplanching digestion. It's necessary for both the gastric motor and secretory activity. Okay, so when we talk about diabetics, we're talking about decreased secretory activity. We're talking about many things. We're not just talking about what's happening in the blood, we're talking about the digestive processes. Uh, it's also important for the absorption and removal of digestive substances. And you actually have different types of increases in blood according to what you eat. So if you drink a glass of fruit juice, you're going to have a higher demand on your blood circulation than if you eat a piece of fish, which is mainly protein and fat, instead of carbohydrate. So the body responds very differently with blood circulation. Now, crucially, postprandial hyperemia requires a compensatory postprandial sympathetic activation. You have to change the arterial flow. And this is normally done by an increase in cardiac activity. And this preserves the sympathetic, uh, the systemic blood pressure. Otherwise, it falls. 
Now, in the digestion, we have two phases. We have the gastric phase. So we can think of your stomach is like a balloon. You put in stuff, whatever, it fills up, and it fills up, and it fills up, and that's called the gastric phase. And it's called stomach extension. So your stomach is actually a storage area. And that will continue, you fill up, until the body feels, okay, we've got this in some type of equilibrium. When the equilibrium is achieved, you start releasing into the small intestine. And it's only in the small intestine will you actually really digest and absorb the food. If you have an inadequate postprandial hyperemia, you get digestive problems, and this is very typical for elderly people and diabetics, and it's a special problem called gastroparesis, which is called delayed stomach or gastric emptying. Uh, this is very much older people who don't eat much. And they don't eat much because they can't digest much. So therefore they say, oh, the food tastes terrible. They stop eating halfway through a meal. If essentially, they are starving because of they can't digest the food. It also leads to systemic problems, circulatory problems, <coughs> hypertension, syncope, angina, stroke. Postprandial hypertension is an independent predictor of mortality uh, and may trigger like, lots of problems, all of circulation problems. Uh, Postprandial hypertension is also an important clinical problem in the elderly and a major cause of morbidity. Current pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic uh, management is optimal as of 2014. So we studied the effect of bitter tastings on the cardiovascular system. Uh, we took the two classic European herbs, uh, Gentiana lutea and Artemisia absinthum, which in the future we'll call gentian and wormwood. And we looked at healthy adults aged between 20 and 60 and used room temperature water. Uh, water temperature is a major factor. Uh, so cold water, room temperature water, body temperature water, and over body temperature water can all be different responses. In the first part, uh, we looked at different capsules. So we're interested to test the local, uh, whether the, these herbs had an effect when they opened in the gut. And we took the 1,000 milligrams of each herb, divided in three, so there were three capsules, and 100 milliliters of water. In the second part, we flavored the water with wormwood and we used the extract containing uh, 500 milligrams in the first one or 1500 milligrams in the higher dose. These are referred to as WS, uh, wormwood small, wormwood large WL, and they contain approximately so 4 milligrams and 12 milligrams of lactones here. In the second part, we looked at gentian here. Uh, it's similar, uh, and these are the uh, glycosides in gentian, high doses. So this gave us a chance to compare uh, two different herbs locally and uh, also for cephalic stimulation. <laughs> I'm presenting the data here in Z scores. <coughs> for those of you who don't remember Z scores from the beginning of the statistics course, Z scores you take away the mean and you divide by the standard deviation. So the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So that means it's very easy to compare you know, different units, different measures. And uh, we can say, a half a standard deviation here is what Cohen's D describes as a medium effect. So anything of 0.5, we're looking at often a significant effect. And we see that 
just taking the water with the placebo capsules, we get an initial response here, increase in systolic blood pressure, which is then comes again here after five minutes. So this is your gastric area. And this has more to do with the swallowing effect. Uh, diastolic pressure, probably not affected, but systolic pressure, definitely affected by drinking a, a deciliter of water, which is one of the reasons why you shouldn't measure your blood pressure after drinking water, which is often offered in clinics. So it's a good way of making patients sick. So our next question then is, what is the source of this increase in blood pressure? Is it cardiac from the heart or vascular? <coughs> is it the arteries? And here we see we have cardiac output and peripheral vascular resistance. And we see the increase here is in the cardiac. So we're increasing our cardiac output. And on the other hand, the vascular here is dropping. Uh, marginally, but definitely not the source of the increase in blood pressure. So what is our cardiac source? Uh, we have three central sources here for cardiac. It could be heart rate, or it could be DPDT. DPDT is a measure of contractility or the heart, how much it pulls together. So this is uh, also controlled by the uh, sympathetic nerve system. And uh, because most of you love chemistry, you should be familiar with digitalis, which increases contraction and decreases rate. Uh, and then we have stroke volume. Stroke volume often is related to contraction force because you're pumping out more but it can also be related to breathing. So if you increased your breathing rate, you would be pumping more blood through the heart, and that would also increase. So in that case, if it was a change in breathing, you would expect to see the stroke volume above the contraction force. If it's contraction force that's causing the stroke volume increase, it should be under that curve. So when we look at this, we see Heart rate? No, heart rate drops. So heart rate is not the reason we're increasing the cardiac output. In fact, it appears to be the contraction force is increasing. Now, this may surprise you, but this is actually the first time this has been recorded. Because people in this area of, the, this area of research aren't as scientific often as people in the chemistry side. So even fundamentals, like what happens when you drink a glass of water, uh, people have basically failed to ask the question. Now, when we added, we're going to the next section now, <coughs> and we can say at the outset that when we use the capsules here, the gentian capsule and the wormwood capsule, we've got no effect. So we can kind of put that on the side, say, so, okay, that's not interesting at the moment. But what we do see is effects uh, for the, the fluids. This is a little bit complicated here. Where we said PC control, these are the things we looked at before. This is in the uh, five to 15 minute interval. Uh, P5 refers between five and 10 minutes, and P10 between 10 and 15 minutes. Now. It's only in this time after P or in this period P10 where the capsule opens. So capsules are very standard, they're produced uh, so that they'll open after between say seven and 10 minutes. Uh, so we know that in this 10 to 15 minute area, we're getting exposure of the receptors. Uh, on the other hand here, we chose this because P5 to P10 because it's as close as we could get to the ingestion time at, while also leaving out factors associated with a digestion and also perhaps a startle response. 
So a start to response is going to be where something happens and you go, Ugh! it's too much. It's like, you know, in psychology experiments where they, they put up a horrible picture in front of you and increases your blood pressure, increases your heart rate, and they say, look, you almost died because of stress. So start to response, and this appears to be a start to response occurring here at the higher dose of uh, wormwood. So when we look at our analysis here, we see an effect here on the systolic blood pressure. It's increased. Basically, the others are unchanged. This one looks a little bit weird, uh, <coughs> but at least it's still within. Uh, then these are standard errors of the mean here. So I mean, it's, it's not as far away statistically as it looks on the picture of diagram. Uh, here we're looking at the systolic pressure and again it looks like we could be having a startle response here. So when you drink the water, the systolic, the diastolic pressure increases here. Now when we added the bitter tastants, uh, gentian small, gentian large and worm with large, the diastolic pressure actually increased when you look at the graph, but not significantly. But it's a little hint that, well, maybe something's happening there. Here we're starting to see big changes. Now, this is our control here, and there was no effect here on cardiac output. This is our cardiac output from the placebo capsule. And what we're seeing is a decrease here in uh, cardiac output. Now that's quite strange, isn't it? Because remember we said before you needed the cardiac output to increase to compensate for the gut, for the gut opening up and all the blood flushing it. So here we're seeing cardiac output actually decreasing when we're taking the bitters, which you would actually think was negative. Here we're seeing something exactly the opposite. Now, with the control situation, there was no change in the peripheral resistance. So the peripheral resistance is the tonus in the arteries. It's not changing. If you just drink a glass of water, that's good. You don't want it to drop, because that's what the heart is increasing activity so that it doesn't drop in the periphery. But what we're seeing here with both levels of gentian and the higher dose of wormwood, that actually peripheral resistance is increasing. So this is a cephalic response in the arteries, because when we don't see it at all here in the capsules, so this is really the key response. And when we look at it here, uh, this at the bottom here, it's the placebo, and here we see the effect of the bitter herbs. Now, exactly whether you're going to get a change and how much of a change will depend a little bit on exactly which segment you decide to analyze here. Uh, but this is, we're looking at between five and 10 minutes. And uh, basically we're looking at an area under the curve here. Now, when we're looking at the control situation here for the heart rate, it's decreasing. And it's decreasing for all of them. So why would that decrease? If the cardiac output it's increasing, why would the heart rate drop? The reason is because the reaction from the increase in uh, cardiac contractility is so strong, it's pushing up, the, it's pushing up the, the blood pressure, and the blood pressure is then, via the baroreflex, reducing the heart rate. And this is not affected by this. 
again by looking at this startle effect. And here we see that an increase in contractility from the water, and we see this line going up there, and it's actually decreasing when we're taking the higher doses of the bitters. So the heart is working less when you take the bitters. We also see the decrease in stroke volume. Very marked decrease here on the diagram. Statistically significant. So our conclusions are encapsulated wormwood and gentian do not alter gastric phase postprandial hemodynamics. The fluids do. So what is happening is a rapid sympathetic autonomic response. Neither the cephalic vagal response nor the local reflex theory predicted these outcomes. Rather, the results support a cephalic sympathetic uh, reflex model. Increased peripheral resistance reduces cardiac workload and supports cardiac activity in maintaining blood pressure during the gastric phase, and presumably whenever digested. So you can take it an hour after you digested the food, and it's still going to have an effect on the peripheral resistance. And this is why it's so wonderful to use the receptors in the mouth rather than the receptors in the gut, because they're always available, and because it's quite fresh. They're not going to get mixed up with chine. Uh, and gentian and worm or fluid extracts have the potential to reduce inadequate postprandial hyperemia and support cardiac conditions. Bingo. Thank you. Looks like a very interesting. Any question? One or two, please. Yes. Uh, I, I'm confused. So you're saying this is a sympathetic response? Yes. I would expect to be parasympathetic sympathetic response. Yes, you would. Because you read the books. And all the books are wrong. <laughs> Things have to change. No, I mean, if you stimulate the acetyl coating receptor, right? Well, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not at that level. What I'm looking at is a whole body I mean, response. But I mean, okay. you can still get vasodilation yeah. or, or the vasodilation contraction, that's what I mean. The vasodilation comes only in with nitric oxide. That's the classical pharmacological. Mm. But at the same time, you get a decrease in heart rate. So the stimulation of the parasympathetic system would also explain your results, I think. No. No, because what's happening is, and this is where you have like first order and second order. You have primary and secondary responses. The primary response is the increase in blood pressure which in the first case is being caused by the increase in DPPP, or the cardiac contractility. That is then causing an increase in blood pressure, which is then going through the, the baroreflex system to decrease the heart rate. So it's some kind of compensatory mechanism. Well, I, I, primary, secondary, th things are uh, happening okay. on orders. Uh -huh. I, I gotta think about that. This is but it's also, um, because we did it with the, the different capsules and the different fluids, it's internally consistent.